You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. When we hear the word mine in South Dakota, we think of gold. No wonder, for much of the 20th century, South Dakota led all other states in mining gold, the valuable yellow metal used around the world as money, or shaped into jewelry, or put to work in medicine and electronics. Most South Dakota gold came from the huge homestake mine at Lead, where miners dug nearly two miles straight down beneath their city through hard rock. But there's more to mining in our state than gold. In the late 1800s, South Dakotans were nearly as excited by something they called pink gold as they were about the yellow metal. They also called this pink rock granite, but in fact, it was a super hard stone called quartzite. You can still find it in spots across eastern South Dakota, including Falls Park in Sioux Falls. You can also see quartzite that was mined or quarried and shaped into blocks for sturdy, beautiful buildings. Sioux Falls and Del Rapids have lots of quartzite buildings. That's because workers at Del Rapids cut a lot of quartzite from the ground. And so did Sioux Falls Granite Company employees in a little town called Ives, just east of Sioux Falls. While everyone agreed quartzite made pretty buildings, Turning the stone into pavers made the most money. Pavers were pieces of quartzite cut smooth and narrow, and then fit together to create a smooth surface for city streets. It wasn't only South Dakota towns that bought these pavers for streets. In 1889, Sioux Falls Granite Company shipped 62 million pavers by trains to Omaha, Kansas City, Chicago, and Detroit. In the late 1800s, South Dakota quartzite cutters usually worked six days a week, 10 hours a day and made three to six dollars a day. That was considered good money then and was about the same amount gold miners earned in the Black Hills. But the good times didn't last. Money was tight all across the United States in the 1890s and cities stopped buying so many pavers. Then in the early 1900s, something came along that spelled the end of quartzite streets. Cement, even Sioux Falls, right next door to the paver makers, began using cement for its streets in 1912. Mining and quarrying are sometimes called boom and bust businesses. Boom means plenty of stone or metal is being mined and people are paying good money for it. Bust means the supply of whatever is being mined runs out or as happened to the Sioux Falls Granite Company, customers stop buying. When a bust happens, miners pack up and leave. The town of Ives became a lonely place. Quartzite wasn't the only thing mined in eastern South Dakota. People today think of Palisade State Park near Garrison as a quiet spot to enjoy nature. But in 1886, silver was discovered here. Miners swarmed to Split Rock Creek, hoping to strike it rich. But the silver boom went bust in just a few years. If you look carefully when you visit the state park today, you can still see where the old Merrimack Lode mine was dug. Silver and gold are glamorous metals because we use them for jewelry. Coal is valuable in a different way because it can be burned for warmth and energy. South Dakota coal mines were mostly open quarries, not underground mines. The first began at Edgemont in 1895. By the 1930s, 21 coal mines were in business in South Dakota. A state-owned coal mine opened at Fire Steel during the winter of 1933-34. Those were hard years. Not enough rain, dust storm, and once again, tight money. The state mine gave away lots of coal to needy South Dakotans so they wouldn't freeze in winter. 
The mine went bust in 1936 because state government decided it could buy cheaper coal from other places. In the 1950s, another mining product that supplied energy stirred big excitement in South Dakota. There was new technology for making electricity at nuclear power plants. These plants needed a fuel called uranium. Uranium was found in rocky soil in western South Dakota. Because it seemed like nuclear power was a sure bet for the future, plenty of South Dakotans hoped to make millions digging uranium. In 1952, the United States government opened a center for buying uranium at Edgemont. Trucks full of uranium soil made their way to Edgemont for just a few years. Then uranium went bust, partly because of western South Dakota's size. For many miners, it cost more to drive a truck to Edgemont than they were paid for their load of uranium soil. But while all this booming and busting was happening other places, Homestake Mine kept digging gold. Gold was discovered in the Black Hills in 1874 by an army expedition led by George Custer. And thousands of people rushed to the area, hoping to strike it rich. They came even though the government said the hills belonged to the Lakota-speaking people, and outsiders had no legal right to be there. George Hurst wasn't like others hoping to strike it rich. He was already rich, and he used his wealth to buy Homestake in 1877, as well as smaller lead area mines. Then he hired the best mine builders in the nation and the latest equipment. Hurst built an amazing underground world and an equally amazing community above ground, thanks partly to his wife, Phoebe. She put together a library for lead and started a kindergarten. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, people from around the world moved to lead for homestake jobs. They brought languages, clothing styles, and customs from England, Italy, Ireland, and Eastern European lands they called Slavic nations. They landed in New York, and my mother was uh, scared to death. My father had left her with the baggage while he checked with customs. And all these strange languages just had her frightened. She was ready to jump on the ship and go back to Yugoslavia. But uh, once all that was taken care of, they uh, took the train from New York all the way to South Dakota. And when they got here, why, she found out it was completely different because of the fact that there were so many uh, Croatian people in the area that my father had uh, purchased a home and uh, Croatians were basically Catholic, and it was right next to the Catholic church and the Catholic school, so this suited her fine. With all the other uh, Slav ladies in the neighborhood, she was able to really make her way around real easy. Uh, as kids grew up, we didn't know a word of English until we started school, because my mother spoke nothing but Slav uh, when she was first here. And then she learned English and how to read and write through the uh, Catholic school, which we would bring home our lessons and she would uh, learn off of them. The, uh, she never got to go to school in Yugoslavia because the girls were raised to be, to work the house and the gardens and all the work and the men were raised to be politicians and what have you. So uh, the only reason she learned anything about reading or what have you was through the Catholic priest in her parish. Every Sunday the girls would, would go to catechism and uh, the priest would teach them how to read and write, write. The boys all got to go to school and what have you. So uh, learning how to do that and coming to a, a town like this, she really was fortunate in the fact that Lead was built the way it was. Work at Homestake was always dangerous. Miners had to be careful around explosives and powerful machinery. The biggest dangers were chunks of rock that could crash down from tunnel ceilings. Visitors were sometimes surprised by all the teasing and pranks workers pulled on one another. Miners said joking around helped them feel less tense. 
miners had a tendency to be kind of jumpy. And uh, so sometimes a, a loud noise would make them really jump. Uh, sometimes a good hard pat on the back would make them strike out. <laughs> sometimes they would hide in a dark place and jump out at a person. Uh, that was always fun. <laughs> Pranks stopped once the work of blasting and hauling rock began, and miners knew their fellow workers would risk their lives for them if an emergency ever happened. Homestake workers got underground by dropping thousands of feet in big rattling elevators they called cages. They entered a world with its own time. Whether they started their workday in morning, afternoon, or night, they called the beginning of the work period morning. Just as the town of Leed was a place with languages in addition to English, Homestake had its own language that seemed foreign to visitors. The tunnels miners blasted, 400 miles of them, were called drifts. Passages that went up and down were shafts if they went clear to the surface, or windses if they didn't. The hard work of loading rock after it had been blasted was mucking, and the spot where that work happened was a stope. Drifting, mucking, it is a whole different language there. But it's just like any other, it's like being on a ship almost. You're, you're in a whole a little world all your own and, and uh, it has its own language. So, and you simply learn by being there and doing the work. For most of Homestake's history, the United States government set prices for gold and limited who could own big amounts of it. But starting in 1968, the government began removing these rules, and within a few years anyone could own gold and pay whatever they were willing to pay for it. They were willing to pay a lot. The price shot up from $35 an ounce to several hundred dollars. In the 1980s, gold prices were so good that several new mines began digging. Those were open mines, like quarries. Even Homestake put some of its miners to work on the surface in an area next to Lead called the Open Cut. No one knows exactly why, but by the late 1980s and all through the 1990s, people were much less willing to pay big dollars for gold. Prices fell. The new surface mines began going bust, some because they ran out of gold, some because of low prices. Could the same thing happen to the great Homestake? It seemed unthinkable. But in the year 2000, Homestake said it would close at the end of 2001, after 125 years. Mine leaders said they needed gold to sell at $325 an ounce for the mine to make money. The day the closing was announced, gold was priced at $272 an ounce. Today, workers take oil and natural gas out of the ground. All across the state, gravel is quarried for roads. The days of underground mining are over, though, and only a few surface gold mines remain in business. But we celebrate the way mining shaped our lives as South Dakotans and our history. For additional information, a teacher's guide, games, quizzes, and more, log on to dakotapathways.org.